Hello YouTube. Today, welcome back to a new Educated Barbarian Analysis. We're going to start right now with the recommendations for the next cycle. So we spent about six to seven months on Bushido and uh, Samurai Wisdom, right? The next step is going to be Stoicism. And we're going to do it through two books. So the very first book is going to be Stoic Classic Collection. And it contains three pieces. So it contains the meditations of uh, Marcus Aurelius, the Enchiridion of Epictetus, and the uh, essay on the happy life by Seneca. Okay? So you can either buy this edition. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of the Stoic collection okay? that has three of them. It's cheap. Or you can buy, buy each of them. It's uh, up to you. And this one is going to be the number one book. The second book is going to be the discourses by Epictetus that we're also going to be reading here. Um, this one, you can buy whatever collection you want. I'm buying the Everyman collection. Personally, it doesn't really make a difference, but since I sometimes cite pages, it might help you follow up. The reason for these two is because as far as a Bible for Stoicism might be concerned, this would be the one. Uh, if you read Stoic authors, they all refer to the discourses and to Epictetus sort of as their maître à penser, sort of as, the, as their mentor. So it's the one I picked. The issue is that this is a really thick book and it's very dense in its concepts and precepts. And I didn't want to uh, throw you into that head first. So before that, I think that this is a great introduction, especially because uh, Marco Aurelius is not a contemporary of Epictetus. He lived after him. Uh, and he, I think he gives a good introduction to Stoicism. It's not too complex. After that, the Enchiridion is very small. It's a very small piece of literature. And then Seneca is, uh, is a good transition into a more uh, complete definition and exposition of what Stoicism is. So this is going to be the next cycle. As always, I'm giving you these uh, way ahead in time. We won't start them for another two months, I think. So it gives you time to read them because uh, I want you to not be convinced that what I say is the right analysis. You need to make your, up your own mind and the videos I make help complete that and help you maybe understand things you didn't. So you're going to start reading this book first and then this one. Okay. And I don't know how much this is going to take us, but they're both quite thick and there's a lot of things to say about them. So We'll spend some time with them. But for today, we're going back with the Agakure. We still have half of the book to cover. And we just started book two. And because I stopped the video early last time, and also because I just spent some time giving you the recommendations for next cycle, I'm going to be uh, spoiling you a little bit. We're going to spend a little bit longer on this one. Okay? So let's settle our mind and calmly attack book two. Book two, which is, I think, my favorite book of the Agakure. Okay. Shoujo starts. Look around you. People become arrogant and conceited when enjoying success. It is most unbecoming. Therefore, a man who has not endured hardship will lack resilience at his core. It is best to experience adversity when one is young. Of little use is a man who is weak and feeble in stressful times. Okay. So here, sort of, uh, Shoujo is sort of telling you to observe your contemporary, right? And to notice that it's quite common for people to fill themselves the second things go their way. And that goes also with uh, the giving of responsibilities and power. You will have noticed, and, or you will eventually in your life. Uh, spot experienced people who will be given an inch of power and they will immediately abuse it. And you might ask yourself, how is that that this tiny bit of responsibility of agency immediately got to their head and turned them into someone who could be categorized as evil? And the reason is exposed by Shoujo is because they've never had it before. So they were not acclimated to it and it immediately corrupts them to the core because it's a brand new poison for them. And in the same vein, for people who've never ended the hardship, the second something happens to them, they break. And I've spoken about that in the last episode. 
you don't want to try and dodge difficulties in life because they prepare you for the upcoming difficulties. See, you're sort of the equivalent of a rock that's being hit by waves. But unlike a rock which might become eroded over time, you become stronger. If you're a rock that has never really seen the high sea and you're tossed in there and you hit a massive wave, you're going to just be washed away. You won't be able to tank it because you are not prepared. Every single hardship prepares you for the next. And it might not be very... It's not a super happy angle to see life but it's what life is. So you can either deal with it and actually resist and be resilient and be a warrior, or you can ignore it and you end up being weak and feeble. And the issue if you're weak and feeble is that not only are you going to be swept away, but you won't even be able to help the people you love because you won't be reliable. To summarize the essence of samurai hood, First and foremost, the warrior must be devoted body and soul to his lord. In addition, he must internalize the virtues of wisdom, compassion, and courage. Okay, so for the lord stuff, we'll put that aside because it doesn't really uh, have an impact on our lives nowadays. But as far as the main values, wisdom, which we could call smart life experience, compassion, the fact the, the the extending of the hand, the fact that you're trying to help others, and courage. Courage is self-explanatory, right? It's very important to see that courage is cited last, and that two of the three values are mostly going to be expressed through your spirit and not your mind. Samurai were not uh, idiotic brutes. For the most part, the, the samurai was mainly built through spirituality. And Bushido is mostly a spiritual teaching of sorts. It has very little application in terms of uh, physical. Unlike a lot of religions who will tell you what to eat, what not to eat, how to behave on Fridays, Bushido doesn't really do that. They give you guidelines, but the guidelines are mostly uh, uh, mental. To nurture wisdom simply requires listening to others. Immeasurable knowledge comes from this. Compassion is for the sake of others. It is opting to do good things for other people rather than through selfish motives. Courage is found through greeting one's teeth. So this is an explanation, again, as what I just described as how to attain those traits through what would constitute mental applications of them in everyday life. And they're sort of, they are to the point, but they're simple. How do you learn? How do you get, do you get smarter? You listen. It's so easy, and yet so many people fail at that because they don't know how to listen. And it's not just people. It doesn't just mean taking a lesson from someone. The wood, nature, teaches you every single day. And if you can retain the lessons and apply them to other things, because if you know one thing, you know 10,000 things, your wisdom will know no bounds, and it will keep progressing every day. As far as compassion, I really like that he says it's for others. There's always some type of gratification that comes with compassion because it makes us feel good, but you need to limit that as much as possible. You need to give freely and not expect anything in return. And for the most part, even when you do that, you get things in return because that's whether you believe in karma or not, karma always finds you, whether for good things or bad things. And courage is just greening your teeth, which is to endure. That's as easy as that. Being brave is not an action, it's an, it's an absence of action. It's the absence of fleeing or renouncing. Just stay, just stand, just stand your ground. That's being brave. A yes man will, will withdraw when something happens. You must have strength of will. So lampooning men of weak character will always try to please others, never do that. I know it's tough and it's going to create friction in your life if you're always honest. Sometimes you need to be able to not say certain things if, if only for your own well-being, especially if you live in certain countries because you will be sent in jail. But even for the people around you, sometimes some people are not able to handle the, what you consider to be the truth because they are sensitive, which is not a bad thing. But you always need to maintain your strength of will. If you start... You're, if you start being dishonest to yourself, your will is going to die. It's going to slowly erode and you want to avoid that. And your will is going to be correlated with your ability to tell the truth because sometimes that's all it takes. It's a strength of will. 
to not renounce and to actually go forth with what you believe is right. You will not fall victim to serious ailments if you take care of yourself beforehand, rather than resorting to treatment after you contract an illness. Agreed and agreed 100%. You can prepare your body to be so strong that illnesses cannot even touch you, no matter what consequences might occur. And uh, once that's done, you won't have to worry about it anymore because you won't get sick. I haven't been sick in 10 years and uh, I intend on continuing that on that path. A lot of people, they end up having completely disorganized um, lifestyles, their hygiene is poor, and they often get sick. It would be so much easier to fix their, their body first before trying to fix the illnesses. And yet, it seems like those people never learn. Those are the people who are always sick. And you would think at some point that they would get tired of taking the drugs and they would find a way to make their body more resilient, but they never do. So don't be that person. All that matters is having single-minded purpose in then, here, and now. Life is an ongoing succession of one will at a time, each and every moment. A man who realizes the truth need not hurry or seek anything else anymore. Just live in the present with single-minded purpose. People forget this important truth and keep seeking other things to accomplish. The realization of hard work happens one step at a time, and that's what people fail to realize again and again. When I'm personally asked by people in my life, ever since I started, how did you do it? How do you keep training? How do you keep progressing? It's simple. I just do it, and I do it one day at a time. If you look at the task as being a hundred days of training, then yes, it's discouraging because you don't have the ability to handle a hundred days of training, not at once. But if you have the ability to handle one day at a time, that's going to lead up to 100 days. It's the equivalent of me showing you a mountain and saying, move that mountain. Well, you can't move the mountain, but you can move one rock at a time, and eventually you will have moved that mountain. So you always have to keep that in mind. Single-minded purpose, focused on what you're doing. Once that's done, you move on to something else, and you can accomplish whatever you, you put your mind to when you do that. And that's what will is, by the way. Will is a constant in your life that allows you to do things. But you don't do everything at once. You apply your will to one thing. Having the resolve to stay the course comes only with years of dedicated training. If you are enlightened to, the, to this mindset just once, it will always be with you, even if you are not conscious of it every day. Your life will become simple and clear if you are unwavering in purpose, knowing that now is the time to act. We've discussed that before, with discipline being the most important thing and with the value of hard work being a realization that never leaves you and that really can take you anywhere. It's the greatest gift you can, you can give to a kid if you have ch children one day. Make them realize how powerful hard work is and you'll never have to teach them again. Because once that is learned, it's never unlearned. And it stays with you forever. But it sometimes takes time, you know, because you need to apply yourself repeatedly and eventually you are enlightened and eventually you realize it. But once you have it, I mean, I've, I've, I know people who lose the mindset, but usually once you have it, it's yours forever. And it makes life easier too, I mean... Because you stop having to worry about the complexity of things when you realize you just have to apply yourself. Current trends cannot be stopped in the flow of time. The world continues to degenerate because you are nearing the end of times. The year is not comprised only of the two pleasant seasons of spring and summer. The same can be said of each day. Thus, any longing for the good old days of a hundred years ago is futile. It is more judicious to adapt and improve the ways of the present. It's so interesting to see that the mindset of the black pill was always present and people like uh, Yamamoto here were always very keen to detect it and, and bash it because it's not productive. And it's something we've always seen, but if you, de if you detect darkness, you, it's up to you to fight the darkness. It, there's no point in just giving up because there is darkness. Because as he says, there is always darkness. There's always a winter. There's always a cold day. Life is not an endless summer. It's always been that way. 
So longing for the summer that is now gone is stupid because you, you might create a reality where it never comes back because of it. And that's dangerous. And here, keep in mind that he speaks about the end of times. It's sort of sarcastic because he knows that there is no such thing as the end of times. The end of times is tomorrow. Tomorrow is the end of times because today is dead and we're moving on. And eventually it keeps happening until you can't even recognize what's around you anymore. That's the end of times. But there's no point in just nostalgia. You need to adapt. Men who hold a nostalgic view of the past are misguided in their outlook because they are blind to the reality of the present. Conversely, those who revel in the present but loathe the customs and traditions of yesteryear can't differentiate between core principles and, and insignificant details. Perfect, perfect. It's just, you see that in today's society too. You have people who are just longing for the good old days and who are completely ineffective because they live in the past so they are like ghosts. And then you have people who detest uh, anything coming from the past. Any tradition is bad. Conservation of the tradition and, and cultures is bad. And anything new is good. Both of these are stupid. I would argue that the latter is more dangerous. Why? Because they tend to be... Um, what is the term? They tend to, to push evolution and they tend to push progress so fast and they don't realize the damage they do. That being said, the previous category is supposed to stop them and prevent them from doing that and they don't. Instead, they oppose each other and they fight. And on one side, you have, if we talk about politics, on one side, you will have the right, the conservatives, and on the left side, you have the progressive. And they bicker about things that they shouldn't even bicker about because as Shojo says, they are both misguided in their understanding on how to progress. That's a sad reality. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see it any, getting any better. It's going to get worse and worse every year. You need nothing more than to maintain a pure mind and stay vigilant as you execute your duties. Just live for each moment with single-minded purpose. The definition of a pure mind might differ from person to person. For me, it's a subjective thing. That being said, by, because it is so subjective, it is objective. A pure mind is a mind that is unchanging and unsoiled. And from individual to individual, it remains true. If you let the, ex the outside world change your values and bend you to its will, you're not pure anymore. You lost that purity. And that's something that is potentially the most precious thing things you have. Religious people call it your soul. Right? He calls it being pure, but that's your soul, that's who you are, that's your core. And if the soul is corrupted, the spirit becomes corrupted and the body eventually becomes corrupted. So you need to uh, maintain that purity at all costs. And, you know, it can be a completely different definition of what maintaining that purity for you might be, but you need to stick to it. You should be proud and claim to be the best in the land when it comes to courage. When training in the way each day, know your faults and learn to shed them. You will not make headway unless you purge yourself of limitations. Amazing quote. Um, some people might call it arrogance. That's not arrogance. That's believing in yourself. And since everything that happens physically happens first spiritually, if you don't have the ability to tell to yourself that you're the best and that you're going to make it, you're never going to make it. So it's very important that you actually do. And when you train, you are constantly trying to reach perfection, even though it doesn't exist, which in a sense is going to destroy any limitations because that's what limitations are. There are things that are going to prevent you from reaching perfection. But since perfection doesn't exist, limitations also do not exist. Treating one's condition after becoming ill is not at all smart. It seems that physicians don't cite the importance of preventive measures before the, ones, the onset of disease. We've, it's sort of a continuation of what he already said. Uh, no offense to doctors, but if people took care of themselves, they wouldn't really be needed anymore. Or we would need at least like 20 or 30% of their workforce. All of the disease you see today are people who either are sort of at the end of their lives and the disease is just there to claim it and they shouldn't be fighting it because it's their time. Or with people who, are, who should be living, who should be healthy, but 
They take such poor care of themselves that they're actually destroying themselves. There are more people in the modern world who ingest food and engage in habits that are negative for their body more than the opposite. Meaning that for most people, if there was a balance of negatives and positive of things that they inflict on their body, most people would be way on the negative side. Meaning that there are a negative influence on their body. <laughs> it's insane to think about it, but if they lost their spirit, if they became vegetables and they couldn't move and engage in any type of behavior, their body would most likely be healthier. That's terrifying to think about. That really tells you how much people, one, are completely dumbed down, and two, are completely disconnected to their body. They, the body and the spirit has been separated. And that is a terrible state of affair for everyone, especially the people involved in the, in the divorce, because they suffer from it, but they can't even realize that they suffer from it. And when the realization sets in, it's usually very tough. So for you to keep that in mind, prevention is more important than the cure. You need to make yourself strong so that you are never sick. And if you want to get into conspiracies, the reason also why Doctors don't really talk about the preventive measures is one because they don't know much about that because they themselves don't practice them because doctors are they are sicker than the rest of the population on average and also they don't want to lose their job as awful as it is they don't really want to give you something you can take uh, you can take to prevent disease because they sort of exist to give you the drugs to cure the disease it's sort of messed up and sometimes it's pushed to the extreme but that's every single job. People who have a job, they are going to want to create an environment where their job is going to perpetuate itself, even if it's not to the benefit of others. As the saying goes, the more water there is, the higher the boat rises. A competent man, or one engrossed in a pursuit he enjoys, will relish the challenge of surmounting difficulties. There is a huge difference between these men and those who feel as though they are drowning when the going gets tough. I feel like um, this gave me a déjà vu. Oh, it's because I read it uh, very recently. Okay. So yeah, very interesting saying. The more high water there is, the higher the boat rises. So the more challenges, the more of a warrior you're going to be because you're going to surmount them. And that's the thing too. You will see that a lot of people who have that strong mindset, when there's an issue, it's fun. It becomes exciting because it's something to defeat. And on the opposite side, you have men who are going to feel like it's the end of the world. And that's the difference between the men who are going to rise and the men who are going to drown. So when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. You know the saying. It's interesting to see that in a Japanese book. I really like the next one. It's interesting to think about. It is unsightly to exhibit fear upon encountering an ox on the road. Oxen don't jab people with their horns from their regular posture. They angle their horns at the target and then move into the trust. You need not be afraid when passing an ox as long as it does not assume a fighting stance. Samurai should also be mindful of such particulars. So before even that, I want to say one thing. Why would the ox try to hurt you. Um, in my mountains, where some of my family live, because of uh, natural selection, the, the, the cows, not the ox, the cows still have horns, and they have horns that are like this. Biggest horns you've ever seen in your life. And the reason why is because there are still wolves around, and they need them to defend themselves. So they never, unlike some of the cows in Europe, which were protected by the farmers and by dogs, and who didn't need the horns anymore, these guys need them, so they still use them. You can walk through these guys, they could kill you if they wanted, easily, but they don't, because why would they, they kill you? They have no reason to kill you. Same logic with wasps. If a wasp lands on you, why would you be afraid? It's not gonna sting you, it has no reason to. So that's just a parenthesis, but what he says here is that there is no need to fear something if there's no, not a clear indication it's gonna happen. It's sort of the, the mentality of a stoic, right? If it's going to happen and you know it, you prevent it, so you don't have to worry about it. If you don't know that's going to happen because there is no sign, there is no reason to worry about it because you don't know it's going to happen. It's the same logic. If you keep 
building up anxious energy for everything in life, even though there are no clear signs it's going to happen, the, the very pattern and action of doing that is going to be more detrimental than the actual negative actions that would have happened if you didn't prepare, if that makes sense. It is a crime to have no serious purpose, living idly and giving little consideration to what a warrior should be, even in your dreams. I agree. That being said, I'm not one to tell people how to lead their lives, but I do think that everyone would be happier if they had a purpose. If you don't have a purpose in life, your purpose in life becomes to find the purpose. That's as easy as that. You can't just float through it like a zombie and just wait for things to happen. You have to find things. And one thing is going to make your heart beat. We all have things that are going to make us very happy. We just need to find them. Realize that the time is now. Come up with a plan to meet any situation in a flash and carve it in your heart. There is a saying, it is curious how people aimlessly negotiate their way through life. The way of the warrior entails a rehearsal of death morning after morning, picturing one's life ending here or there and imagining the worst, most wonderful way of dying. Decide adamantly that one's heart is in death. This is all a samurai needs to concern himself with. It is demanding, but totally achievable. Nothing is impossible. So as far as the time is now thing, it's what I expressed before, what he said before with the single minded purpose and decision making. But you need to really have that in your heart. I think we all have that moment where we make a promise to ourselves, and that promise never leaves us. And it's that discussion you have with yourself that's important because it's, as he says, it's engraved in your heart. You can never live without it again. And it's true that, as he says, there are some people who sort of, you know, they, as he says, negotiate their way through life. You're not really sure why they're here. Sometimes you wonder if, if maybe they, you know, they were visited by someone or something that told them that the real life starts after death because they don't seem to be super interested in making something out of their existence right now. Uh, usually, you know, you could call them depressed people, not in the clinical sense, in the, uh, in the, in the psychical and physiological sense. And for me, the solution is always the same. It's to find that purpose. And as far as the real soul of death, it sounds a little bit morbid to think about your death, but once you accept the, the very limitations of your existence and that it's going to end, it gives the existence flavor because you know it's going to end. And, you know, it's not going to, if you stay strong, having have an impact on you that is going to throw you, you know, out of work or destroy your emotions, because it's just, it's just the end of the road. That's it. It's a door that closes. And it's the closer you get to the door, the tougher it is to maintain that behavior. I perfectly agree with that. I'm 25. I know I'm not going to die anytime soon. So it's easy for me to act brave. I hope that I will be able to maintain that spirit as I age. And I'm going to leave you with this last one. And this is Shoujo saying that if I had kept a record of my changing opinions since my youth, it would exceed one or 200 times. It is never ending. I wish I could come to understand the supreme level. And his master replied, the process of rethinking one's stance is important. When you think you have discovered the secret, this is already a mistake. Know that your study will last for as long as you are breathing. Same logic. The way is eternal. You have achieved the way of the warrior when you die and never before. You cannot achieve it before. It's endless. And a man who stops learning, a man who stops accepting challenges is a man who's already dead. I'm going to leave you with that. We're going to uh, continue with book uh, two next time. And we are page... 157, we're actually going to start at 158 and we are at uh, number 61. Thank you for watching and have a good day.